The tools I'll show you in this video have completely changed my Python workflow. They've saved me hundreds of hours of development time, and they're ones that I believe every Python developer should at least be considering, if not using in their workflow. With that said, let's get into it. I'll go through each tool quite quickly, and links to each of them will be available from the description down below. Let's dive in. Now, the first tool on my list here may seem obvious, especially in 2025 with the AI era, but that is Cursor. Now, Cursor, in my opinion, is the best all-around AI code editor. Now, I'm just on the landing page here. I'll leave a link to it in the description, but this is really what I use most of the time when I'm writing code, especially very large pieces of code, not just in Python, but in many other programming languages as well. Now, Cursor works great because it has that traditional VS Code feel, as you can see right here, it looks exactly like VS Code, except it also has the ability to directly interface with an agent. So for me, rather than using, you know, the full blown AI coders that do everything for you and, you know, don't even show you the code, I prefer to have a more granular approach where I'll use these, you know, like quick edit features where I'll quickly say, you know, refactor this to be cleaner or something, right? And just have it automatically generate the code for me. Or I'll go here to the agent mode, you know, I'll tag in the different files that I want to change, like the check in listener, review this file whatever, right? I'm just giving you kind of dummy examples, change this to ask mode, go ahead and ask it. Cursor has been getting upgraded constantly. It's quite good. And for any AI code generation, this is really the go-to tool for me because I get to keep that same environment where I actually am in control of the code. I can, you know, step through it, go to the definitions, all of that kind of stuff while still getting the advantage of the code generation in a format that feels like I'm much more in control. Anyways, don't need to talk about too much more here. Point is I use cursor pretty much all the time. It's very good. I've spent thousands of dollars in code generation credits and well, it definitely has changed my workflow. Now the next tool on my list is UV. Now UV is one of my favorites recently and it's just a much better package manager that's significantly faster than using something like pip. You can see here that on average, it's anywhere from 10 to 100 times faster than using standard pip. It's just much easier to use. I find the commands make a lot more sense and I'm always using it to initialize new projects. I have a full tutorial on UV that I'll leave on screen in case you want to check it out. But let me give you some quick example usage. So whenever you're working with UV, first of all, you need to install it. It's funny enough, you can actually do that by using pip. So you can say pip install UV. But once you've got UV installed, you can type UV init and then dot in any directory where you want to initialize a new Python project. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. You'll see that it automatically creates a few files for you, like the Python version file, main.py, pyproject.toml, which replaces your requirements.txt. And then you can very easily add Python packages by typing UV add. So I can do something like UV add streamlit, right? And then boom, it gets added almost instantly. I can also do something like UV add and then let's go with maybe fast API. And same thing, very quickly, it adds all the packages and adds it to my pyproject.toml. Now, the interesting thing is that UV automatically handles running your virtual environment for you. So you can see that it's created this .vnv folder for me. I don't need to activate any environment. I don't need to run any special commands. And it's automatically used this Python version, which is 3.13. But I can change the version here, and it will automatically adjust the venv file for me. Now, in order for me to actually run the file that I have here, I can use the command uv run, and then the name of my Python file, which in this case is main.py. When I use this uv pre Prefix, what's going to happen is it will automatically look for the virtual environment and it will use that virtual environment interpreter to run this code. So for example, if I just, you know, import something like fast API, right? And then I run this, you can see that we don't get any errors. Just wait a second. It says hello from Python tools because it's using this interpreter. Now that's the thing that I love about UV. It automatically handles the virtual environment for you. You don't need to worry about activating, deactivating, and then you just simply use this command. Now, there's a lot of other commands that you can use. For example, you could do something like UV run and then streamlit run then main.py. When you do this, it will allow you to use all of those kind of Python tools that have their own commands like streamlet, for example. So if I do that, you'll see that it will just run this file. I don't think we're going to get anything because I didn't initialize streamlet here, but you get the idea. And then it runs this using UV. So UV is just best. You can also do something like UV remove, you know, fast API gets rid of it for you, removes it from the, from the pyproject.toml. It is faster. It is better. It is easier. You should just use it. The next tool on my list is absolutely essential, and that is python.env. Now, this is a Python package that can be installed using pip or uv, like the following, uv add python.env. 
Now what this allows you to do is load in environment variable files and access them from inside of your Python code. Now it's a very simple tool, but I use it in pretty much every Python project. And the reason for that is the following. Have a look at what happens if I try to run some normal Python code like this, where I try to load in some environment variables. I try to load in my app name, my debug, my max connections, my API key, etc. I have this .env file. Inside of here, I have a few environment variables like app name, debug mode, max connections. And these are values that would be used in an application to kind of change the behavior of the app and specifically the environment in which it's running it. Now, if I try to load these by using OS and getting the environment, even though I'm in the same directory as my .env file, you'll see that they won't load. So I'll do uv run and then main.py. Notice that it tries to read the values from the .env file, but it just doesn't find them. Even though I've set the app name, the debug mode, all of that, it's saying not set. That's because Python doesn't natively load the environment variable files for you. So you need to use this .env module. The way you use this is the following. You say from .env load.env or import load.env. And then you simply call this function. And just by doing that at the top of your code where you want to access these variables, when you run the code, you'll see that all of these values are now set and defined. Now you of course can do a little bit more configuration here. Sometimes you'll have multiple environment variable files for things like a production environment or a staging environment or a dev or local environment. And if you want, you can load in those individual files as well by changing some of the parameters in the load.env function. So for example, we can load in the base environment variable file. Then we can load in one that's .env .production, local staging, whatever, by using load.env. By running that with override equals true, you'll automatically load in the new environment variable file, as long as it's in the same directory where you currently are. There's a few other functions you can use from this .env module. However, this is the most common and you'll see it in pretty much every Python project. Now building upon this, a lot of times when you're using these environment variable files, you'll want to have some kind of feature flex. So you can maybe enable a beta test or you can have some feature enabled for a particular user, but not for others. Now, if you want to do that, you can use the environment variable, of course, but if you want to manage these remotely, which is typically better in a production environment, then configcat is a great fit. Now, this is especially useful when you want to enable a feature flag for certain users or certain subsets of users. Now, fortunately, this video is sponsored by configcat, which is a simple privacy first feature flag service that helps you release faster and with confidence. Personally, I've used it in the past and it's allowed me to save a lot of pretty bad releases where I had to quickly disable a feature for a bunch of users. Now it has open source SDKs for over 19 platforms, including Python, JavaScript, Ruby, Java, and even Unreal Engine. You can set it up in 10 minutes and start toggling features remotely without redeploying your app. You can use feature flags for gradual rollouts, A-B testing, canary releases, or instant kill switches when something goes wrong, like I did previously. And this is all from one clean, easy to use dashboard. Now ConfigCat never stores your user's data, offers unlimited seats, integrates with your favorite tools, and supports open feature so you can bring your own stack with no vendor lock-in, no surprises, and just predictable pricing that scales with you. Now you can try the free forever plan or get 25% off any paid plan using the code TIM25. Learn more at configcat.com or by clicking the link in the description and make your next release land on its feet, something that I've failed to do many times and been saved by configcat. The next tool on my list is called Rough, and this is an extremely fast Python linter and code formatter. That means it can automatically fix indentation, long lines, you know, failures to adhere to PEP8 standard, and it can lint your code to look for things like unused imports, duplicate variable names, variables that are unused, parameters that have wrong default values, all of those kinds of things, right? Like standard linter features, but just done extremely fast. And you can see the time comparison here. Now, rough is very easy to use. You can simply install it on PyPy. So using pip or by using UV or directly execute it with UVX if you're familiar with that tool. So let's quickly hop into cursor here and I will show you a few examples of its usage and how you can use it to check files, format, etc. And just quickly, because it's on the page, you can also use rough as a GitHub action or a pre-commit hook so that you can actually automatically run this on any of the commits that you make or any of the pull requests on GitHub. So you can make sure that everything's linted and that the formatting happens automatically to keep your code base consistent. Regardless, let's look at some usage. 
All right, so I'm inside of cursor and first things first, if we want to install this, we can use something like UV. So we can say UV add and then rough. So once rough is installed, we can run the command UV run rough and then pass the command specifically with rough that we want to run. We can run the check command. If we do this, this is going to act as a linter and just lint all of the Python files in the current directory. We also can lint an individual file. So for example, I can do messy code.py. If we go here, we'll see there's all kinds of inconsistencies with my styling, with my spaces, all kinds of PEP 8 violations. I've done that on purpose. So if we run this, you'll notice that it tells us all of the problems and how we can go and fix them. Now, this will not fix them all automatically for us, but it is able to fix nine of them, it says. So what we can do is type UV run, then rough, check dash dash fix and then we can put the name of the file in this case it's messy code and when we do that it is able to fix nine of those errors and then if we run it again you can see there's only 14 errors because it fixed some of them and if we have a look here we can see some of the errors that it's fixed it wasn't able to do things like the quotations but it did fix some of the other ones now that's fine we also have the ability to automatically format so for example we can type uv run rough and then rather than check we can just type format and the name of our file like messy code when it does that it's able to reformat everything fix all of the indentation and just overall give us better formatting for the code so that's kind of the basics on rough of course there's a lot of other stuff that you can run with it you can exclude files you know you can add all kinds of different checks you can select certain things you can add configuration but generally speaking if you just want to use it for formatting and linting that's typically what it's the best at and you can have it automatically run on pull requests, which I do all the time. The next tool on my list is PyTest. Pretty straightforward, but this is just the best testing framework in Python, which allows you to automatically test code or to manually test code. Now, PyTest is a relatively simple framework that allows you to write something as basic as just an assert to test maybe like the output of a particular function, but you can test classes, you can add mocks, you can do all kinds of advanced stuff, and you get some really nice output that shows you all of the test failures, passes, etc. So let me show you a quick example, but in terms of using it, I have an entire tutorial, which I will leave on screen right here, which you can check out. Okay. So for PyTest, I'm just inside of a very large repo that I have here for actually a Discord bot for my DevLaunch mentorship program. And you'll see that I have all of these different classes that I've written that do a bunch of different tests using PyTest. So we import PyTest. We're also bringing in some stuff from the unit test, and then we're able to do all kinds of various mocks here and then write our assertions. Now I have all these different tests. I think I have like 65 different test files or something like that. And what's useful is that I can just go into my code here. I can type UV run and then PyTest. And when I do this, what it will do is automatically run all of these tests for me, shows me all of the items it collected, all of the tests that it ran, and then gives me that 65 tests pass. And there was one warning. Now let's say I break something and just change one of their values here. Okay, so let's go UV run PyTest again. It will automatically pick that up and show me where the failure was. So you see that we get the failure view here where it shows us the test that failed. There's some warning here as well. And then it gives us the logs for this failed test where it tells us, you know, this square bot is not ready. You know, this user's not in the server yet, blah, 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 whatever the logs are. And then as we keep going up, we can see where the code was that failed. So extremely useful. I have this automatically run before any deployments and on any pull request to this repository. And it has saved me a ton of manual effort in testing. Again, there's a lot of other stuff you can do with PyTest. I'm not really gonna dive into all of it here. The point is it's changed my workflow. It's worth learning, it's very useful, and it's not that complex, so I would definitely suggest taking a look at it. Moving on, the last but definitely not least tool on my list is Docker. Now, Docker is what I use pretty much all the time now whenever my project starts to get a little bit more complicated, not just for deployment, but also for running my code locally. I'll put a full Docker tutorial on screen in case you want to learn about how it works. But specifically for Python applications, it's very easy to Dockerize or containerize them, which makes it a lot easier when you eventually do get to deployment and for running your code on various different machines or environments without having to remember all of the setup steps. Right now, I just have the Docker Hub open where you can see various containers, volumes, images, etc. that I've used. But typically what I'll do for my Python workflow is I'll create a Docker file, which explains how to run one of my services. I'll have a Docker compose file, which I can use in different environments, especially if I want to run this in production or in staging. And then I may have another one like this Docker compose production, for example, which brings in various environment variables that I need. Now from my local environment, when I'm running my code, what I'll typically do is just run docker compose up 
what this will do is simply run the file for me and get everything ready to go so that I'm able to test this locally without having to remember all of the various different commands. Now this is especially useful when you have different services going on. So I would highly suggest learning Docker, using it for your Python projects and creating these Docker Compose as well as these Docker files so that it's really easy to just run it up, pull it down and spin up the service without you having to create, you know, all kinds of different terminal windows, remember all of the commands, all of that kind of stuff. And you can see here it's downloading everything, you know, getting everything set up for us so that we are good to go. So that's that, that's Docker. Of course, you know, there's a lot more stuff that I could go into here in terms of how it works. But generally speaking, I just create a few of these files. I get my application running inside of Docker and then I'm good to go and it saves me a massive amount of time throughout my Python workflow. So that's it guys. That's all of the tools that I had in this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next one.